give it a try, and instead of getting support from the union, the union went nuts on them. Uh, right, and it, it was very much behind the scenes the way this normally plays out. Right. And um, I think uh, to Senator Groff's credit, he really believed in what he wanted to do and was willing to talk about what happens behind the scenes, uh, which made it for a compelling story for us to tell to some you know, contributors who were willing to try to help raise money, uh, along with Coloradans who raised money for Senator Groff. Um, to, to give him the opportunity to sort of call the union's bluff on, on this bill. I mean, the, the irony is, um, particularly for uh, if, if the unions are against charter schools, this is the kind of legislation that potentially could make charter schools irrelevant. It could allow public schools to have the kind of flexibility that in some ways would take the urgency, you know, r remove the urgency a bit for, for charter schools. Um, uh, and, and it just, uh, it, it was pro-teacher legislation. It was um, supportive of reform. Say that again. It was pro-teacher pro -teacher legislation. These, these, were, these were teachers who wanted to, to make changes They wanted to work school. harder. They wanted to make sure that they had higher standards in their school. Right. And it was their own union they were fighting. Right. They even had the president of the Senate here in Colorado on their side. And, and that's really where you guys came into effect. So wait a second. These are Democrats who are trying to stop a Democrat right. from doing this. So these are pretty courageous guys, Peter, right. like Peter Groff, who, who decided to take this on. Absolutely. I mean, our, our, our theory I, I don't is think we understand. No, absolutely. As, as, you know, we we got to be right. pundits. We say, this is the right thing right. to do. That's the right thing to do. But when you're sitting there in the seat, and the guy who gives you the money to run, and the organizations that have helped you campaign, namely the teachers union, calls you up and says, what the hell are you doing? You can't do this. I'm going to make sure you're out of, out of office. That shakes a politician to the core. It, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of courage to stand up to that. I mean, it, it's tough for the party too. I mean, the, the this. Let's be frank. The Democratic Party could not exist without teachers unions. I mean, they play a crucial role. They provide foot soldiers and go door to door, and, and they play a, a, a very important part in helping um, lower offices. You know, young candidates, the first time running for office, they sort of help you figure out what you've got to do. Um, right up to the presidential campaign. I mean, they, they're willing to co contribute large amounts of money and and you know, use their phone banks and this kind of thing. So so it, it's difficult for the, the Democratic Party to be a party that insists that we actually have a rigorous debate that sometimes may um, bother the teachers' union. So, but we're sort of saying if we're, we're real, we're really the party that represents the, the sort of the downtrodden. We, we've got to be the ones having this conversation. What's the, what's the difference between Democrats and Republicans when it comes to educational reform? You know, we've, we've crossed the aisle. We've held hands with a lot of terrific uh, Democrats who've been brave enough to stand up and say, well, let's put kids first and not the union first. I think what happened to, to um, Senator Bob Hagedorn when he came out for the education scholarship bill, he was also put into a lot of heat, and that, that took a lot of courage for him to stand up. Yes, it did. He was the deciding vote, and our, our voucher bill was, was passed and signed into law, and then, of course, with the help of the teachers' union, it was struck down. I, I was thinking about the, the difference, and, and I think that one of the differences would be, let's take school choice, for instance. A Democrat might say, well, because of social justice reasons, we want these poor children to have an equal education. I think a Republican might say, and certainly a, a free market think tank would say, that's good, that's fine. We want social justice too, but there's another principle here, and that is that uh, we don't care what income level a parent is at, they should have the ability to choose where their kids go to school and to be able to take their tax money and use it wherever they choose. So I think that would be one of the I think the differences. that's right. I, we, we, we look at the um, language that we use in these kind of debates all the time. On our side, when we're talking about this, we tend to talk more about opportunity. Uh, and, and we tend really to be focusing on lowest income uh, uh, residents that benefit from this. Um, and that, that's what puts Democrats into a really tight spot, particularly you think about the inner city Democrats here in Colorado. You know, they're, in, they're from the inner city, so they've got representatives in the state house and the state senate that understand that DPS is failing them. Mm -hmm. They need a choice. If you're living in, in uh, Cherry Creek, chances are your school's probably pretty good, and if it isn't, you might have enough coin that's to be right. able to send your kid to a, school, to a better school. The kids who go to Bruce Randolph, they're not rich parents. They don't have the right parents. So what are you going to do? And now we're finding it's Democrats like you who are, who are making it. It's, it's a certainly at least driving the urgency. I, I don't know where this is going to go, but it, but the the discussion is happening, and it's happening in places all over the country right now. And wh where we're starting to see traction on any of these issues, it's because Democrats are taking control of them and running with them. And in fact, these educational choice things are not going to happen unless Democrats. That's right. And am I right to think? There are more and more Democrats joining this movement that it is easier for a Democrat to say it's time to take on the teachers' union and put our kids first than it was. So it's, it's relative. It's easier ago. than it was, yes. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's still a tough thing to do, though. 
At the same time, I can see that this is going to anger some Republicans because oh, they're, so. they're going to say, and they have said sometimes in the past, this is a Republican issue and they want that difference so that they have that to run on. And well, it, we can, it's, we can find it's some. going to make we some lines some. gray. And we tend to find also the, the ideas about funding schools. We, we tend to, we're, oh, yeah. we're still we'll Democrats. We'll never agree we, there. Exactly. We, we, we still believe that schools require money. <laughs> <laughs> talk, 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 talk to me a little bit about, about cheating Cheating Our Kids. This, this is a book that you put together. I'm, I'm, I'm curious why. It is. Well, actually, I was, uh, I was a journalist before I did uh, this work in politics. I worked for the New York Daily News writing about education. Before that, I was at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, Sentinel and Milwaukee Sentinel. Um, and as a reporter, I was actually frustrated that we were writing stories about some of these horrendous things that were happening in our schools. And, and you know, year after year, the sort of results that are shocking, the kind of things that Roy Romer is going around the country yeah. trying to get people to pay attention to right now. Uh, and like Governor Romer has found in the last year, it is hard to get people worked up about this stuff. And I, I couldn't, sometimes I couldn't believe that there weren't riots in the street over, over some of the things that we're dealing with. Like what? Give me, give me a specific. Give uh, me something uh, that I can uh, sink my teeth into. Why, why, one, what should people be angry about? One piece of data from, um, from New York City. This was at, at the time the, the book was written. Um, you know, in New York State, we have what's called a Regents Diploma, where you've got to pass uh, some basic exams uh, as a high school student in order to get a Regents Diploma. Um, short of that, you get what's called a Local Diploma, which means you just showed up for, for four years and, and made it through. So in order to graduate, you have to take a test. You've got to take the test to do it. Is it a tough um, test? It, it's not. It's not. And, and um, Even I could pass it? Uh, even you could pass it. Yeah, even I could pass it. Uh, it's, uh, we, together That's what we, you're saying. <laughs> maybe together we could pass it. <laughs> together we could pass it. But we're talking about a remedial high school exam. Yeah. yeah, not, I mean, yeah not AP West. This is not AP, no, exactly, right. no, exactly. Okay. This shows that you, you have a, um, you know, a, a basic understanding of how to read and interpret passages, how to do basic math right. and science. Um, it, for Latino and African American students, the percentages of kids who were graduating with a Regents Diploma four years after they started high school in New, York's, uh, New York City was less than 10%, so not even one out of 10. Um, which You're is not to say me. that they weren't graduating. I mean, our graduation rate is about 50%, which is horrible enough. But when you look down at what, who's really graduating and who's getting out with the skills to actually do something like that, it was not even one in 10. Um, that kind of information um, uh, it was, was shocking. And, and for me, um, I think one of the things that's been um, heartening for me in the, in the last year, there's a lot more civil rights groups that are getting involved in this kind of stuff. Reverend Al Sharpton is out front on this kind of stuff right Explain now. Explain that to me. The, the idea that, that, that nice suburban Republicans driving their minivan might have anything in common with Al Sharpton is, is a disturbing notion. Uh, Help it, me understand this. It is. I mean, he, he's sort of gotten to the point where he's saying, these, these are our kids that we're talking about. It. And w the way he describes it in the work that we've done with him, he talks about these, these coalitions between labor, clergy uh, and civil rights groups that sort of formed in the 1970s and, and were formed for the right reasons because they all saw strength in numbers at the time. Um, th it's gotten to the point where those old coalitions are still in place, but they're no longer working for kids. And, and there's, there's sort of a reevaluating going on about those coalitions and whether or not they make a lot of sense. Um, I think a lot of civil rights groups have been completely twisted uh, in the No Child Left Behind sort of debate because all of a sudden they're seeing for the first time disaggregated data for, for you know, students by race, for kids that, you know, families that they represent. Um, they don't exactly want that pulled off the table. They feel like there's finally a, a spotlight on the needs of their specific um, um, community groups. And it's, um, uh, it's it sort of driven a sense of urgency, and and I think other yeah, groups like the I've heard of the NAACP is yeah. starting to have some uh, fights inside that should they take on the educational establishment, and there's a, still a minority, right? But it's growing, and their voices they did growing in Connecticut. inside there. They actually took on the state of Connecticut was uh, was trying to just get out of doing implementing No Child Left Behind, and the NAACP intervened in a lawsuit there and, and said, look, th this is, Connecticut may have some of the best public schools in America. It, those, are, those are schools with largely white, affluent kids in them. Um, Connecticut also leads the nation in the achievement gap, and we wouldn't have had that data if we had not had No Child Left Behind. Explain the achievement gap. Uh, the performance between white uh, students, okay. the difference between white students and black and Latino students for the most part. And, and getting, getting back to this side, there are Republicans who want to hold on to this, say, no, this, this, is, this is our issue. And in the same way that there are Democrats who are upset that, that, um, uh, that you might be talking and working with the Independence Institute, you're doing an event with us, right. you've been uh, helping us on some issues, there, there are some guys on our side say, what are you guys doing talking to a Democrat? Don't you understand? This might not be good for the party. Um, you don't put the party first. Well, I'm a Republican, have been for a long time, but I'm a policy person and I really want to look and see what's best for kids. And I disagree with a lot of Republicans over No Child Left Behind because as Joe was talking about, 